everyone has a has a pathway you could have a pathway you don't even know about in this video we're interviewing a registered migration agent to answer all your questions about visas and migrating to Australia. This video is a general overview of the migration process and it does not constitute legal or visas advice. For this, remember that you should always, always contact a registered migration agent because each individual case is different. Now, let's get started. Hi, Tarane. Hello, Martina. Yes. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. You. Same, yes. Oh. My name is Tarana Arianfa, a registered migration agent. I started migration affairs in the midst of COVID after working a few years for a, a very good law firm in Sydney. And now we have a few lawyers working with us and paralegals. So at Migration Affairs, we specialized in skin migrations, employer sponsorship, difficult student visas, and we have different department sections. So we do also partner visas, character issues, permanent residency cancellation, citizenship, almost all aspect of visa categories. Because of my background, I did about six and a half, year, a half years at Veracess. So we do get quite a lot of clients through a skill assessment process. We do across all the skill assessment bodies, but focus on the uh, occupations on the Veracess, which is the biggest major body in Australia anyway. Not so much undergraduates, because generally speaking, for undergraduates, parents would consult with us and just say which university is better. Or So it depends if they want to just study on the best universities or if they want to migrate to Australia through a study. So it's, the advice would be very different, which pathway it is. Variety of visas, obviously very much depend which country they're from. That's the first things we check. If they want to visit, obviously visitor visas across. If they have family here, they can do sponsor visitor visas. But do get an advice, even if you just want to visit. For some countries, obviously TA countries, it's very straightforward. They do it online through an app. Some of the clients find it difficult, but when you get used to it, you can do it without needing a migration agent or a lawyer. So if you are um, a younger person, like around 18 to 25, 26, you can easily consider studying here, uh, changing your career pathway maybe if you already studied. So that would be student visa subclass 500. Some parents actually ask about this and they can even bring their um, kids from even on high school studying and they can come with them as a guardian on guardian visas. Working holidays that we all know, different countries, but for 417 and 462, so different category of people. Some countries is even up to 35, that you can just come study, work holiday, but there are so many exemptions at the moment. You don't have to work in regional area, for example. So there are skill independent visas for more of a, like maybe 25 plus, if you already worked, study, work in your home country and just want to migrate. The biggest mistake people do, they think they have to come here, definitely study first before they can migrate. No, 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 at all. Most of people are my clients. We get through permanent residency with their background, with what they did in their home countries. And they get surprised. What about my master's? And I said, we don't need it. Don't worry about it. And this year, especially this financial year, we had so many exciting and unexpected outcome for people because they came in studying something that they may not necessarily necessarily like to study just because they thought that's the or the lawyer back in their home country advised them that's the pathway to migrate to Australia not at all if you have a degree even a certificate and you have few years of experience back home depending to your occupation so if it's if you're a trade worker and you work for five years you don't have any qualification that's fine you easily migrate to Australia and you don't need to come and study first and other pathway employer sponsorship visa could be tricky if you live overseas because you first need to secure that employment and your employer wants to really want to bring you over so they sponsor you very quick pathway to PR permanent residency but it's the first step of securing that position could be a bit tricky other things are you may come and visit meet someone to go through partner visa or if you are more senior 40 plus and you already have a business running or you have an idea you want to migrate to Australia you can use business innovation or investment stream and 
And just have in mind, by the end of this financial year, some of these changes, the category that I described will stay the same, but occupation list is going to look different. But still, the pathway is going to be the same. Still, you would need to do a skill assessment. You would need to decide what occupation it is that you do. Who is the assessment authority for it? Get a skill assessment. Get your English done. Get all the steps done and look at what pathway you migrate. So there are definitely many, many pathways and something that you just said in terms of you don't necessarily need to be in Australia to become a permanent resident, but your overseas employment and your overseas qualifications are valid, which is something that many people, many migrants think that, yeah, that's not the case. Exactly. Recently, we had, um, I personally had so many um, Nigerian clients, which they disregard their bachelor degree altogether. And most of the section one, um, most of the national university are section one, even section two, which would be enough for migration. And, and if, if they have a few years of experience that could compensate myself and you you probably know this <laughs> with the background in experience yes 100 percent. yeah and when we're talking about section one section two that's basically the comparability of a, an overseas bachelor degree to an australian qualification right. basically yes. so those are the government guidelines So on the occupation list, there is a big list that everyone has access to, the public has access to, federal list. On that list, there are medium term occupation, which are favorite because you have many visas that you can access through permanent residency. There are short term skilled occupation list, still very good occupations because as long as you can find your occupation, for example, you are an accountant, as long as you can find your occupation on that list, you have a good pathway to PR. But an assistant nurse probably can't find your occupation on that list. So there are other lists, there are other agreements, especially this financial year. So you have to definitely consult with a migration agent or lawyer, especially if your occupation is not on that list. Don't disregard it. Oh, okay, I don't have a pathway for permanent residency. Everyone has a has a pathway. I never met anyone in these five years I've been doing this that I couldn't advise and say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have a pathway, you go study unless my client really want to study i never advise anyone to study if they thinking about migration so that's not the step for migration unless you're 18 years old you don't have any other qualification this yes um, so there are these different lists that you can go. I would say if you're thinking of studying something and say, okay, I want to start something that would be good for migration in future, go through the list to check which occupations are on medium to long term lists. So although the lists going to change by the end of this year, whatever occupations are on medium to long term occupation lists, would stay on a high level demand. So the program will be changing, becoming tier one, tier two, tier three, to the level of the skills and demand in Australia. So this medium occupation, my analysis is stays on that tier one that Australia would need and they are highly skilled. Could be data analyst, could be a scientist, or could be trade workers such as electrician or even air conditioning technician we recently did which is very surprising. My clients didn't even have a qualification, just five years of experience. Straight through PR came, landed to Australia. So its first step is check your occupation. Is it on which list? There are so many different lists, but first step to check federal list. And after that, you can check, okay, I prefer to go to Victoria. So I'm gonna check Victoria state list. If that occupation is on that list, okay, good. What are the requirements for that? If it's a New South Wales list, if in South Australia list, but there's regional list as well for specific visas, regional visas, 491 visas, everywhere, except Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane would consider regional for that visa. So it's big, that's where it become a little bit complicated. So every visa would have a different category of occupation list. 
So for different visa category, it would be different regional areas. For example, 491 is a regional visa for your occupation has to be on that list for that visa. So if you go through list of occupation and you put in your occupation, anything, register nest, and you see, okay, 491 is listed for me. Okay, that means it's available for regional. And for this specific visa, anywhere in Australia, except Sydney City, Melbourne City, Brisbane City would be regional. And everyone asks, what about Adelaide City? Yes, it's regional. What about Gold Coast? Yes, it's regional. What about Perth? Yes, it's regional. For this specific visa, would be regional for this visa. This visa specifically would need you to do a skill assessment. It's actually a really good visa because you only need to prove you have experience in this. You have minimum points. The state invites you. And after grant of this visa, you can be working as whoever you want. If you are an accountant, but in heart you want to be a chef, you can start your career as a chef. As long as you're holding this visa, it does doesn't matter what you do and what occupation you use to get this visa. On this visa, three years work in that area and produce tax return and you can apply for permanent residency. 191. It's a reasonably new visa pathway. 191 introduced in November 2019. So it's pretty new. Yeah, it's interesting. In terms of uh, as well, the regional visas, I, I didn't know that Perth and Adelaide as well were considered uh, regional areas. Yeah, that's... For this specific visa yeah. there is there is an old visa 187 which is long gone or other regional visas they long gone that was a specific postcode and a specific area again for example new south Wales has rda areas which is regional true new south Wales. a lot easier to achieve those because the points are a lot lower it works for people that they already hear and those are specific we have to check for the person whether or not that area is is, for example, if you're living somewhere in regional New South Wales, you could have a pathway you don't even know about because it's a lot. It goes through New South Wales uh, state uh, website. You go check. Okay this occupation that I have and you may not even be working in that occupation at the moment but you have experience in that occupation so whether or not I can go through that region it gets a bit technical for that specific RDA regional you have to check the postcode of the where you're living or where you're working a skill independent migration 189 which is direct pr through federal and doesn't need a state sponsorship 190 which is through states it needs a state sponsorship aspect before you can apply and some of the 188 business innovation visa they point test basis what does that mean there is it actually point test calculation you can anyone has access to it so you go through it there are different categories so one of the things that people gain point on is age, English level, how many years of experience they had overseas, how many years of experience they have in Australia. So that system gives us an estimate of the points. We first do that usually in the consultation when we organize a consultation with the client, initial consultation. So we go through this and minimum expression of interest. You can put an expression of interest with minimum point of 65. But this comes with experience. Whether or not 65 is enough with New South Wales, on that occupation could be very well be more than enough whether or not is 65 is enough for another occupation in adelaide may not be so don't get like oh new south Wales is competitive i don't get anything with 65 no you you may so get an advice because it's very important what's your occupation you could be social worker or you could be in registered nurse 65 would be more than enough but if you're an accountant in new south Wales, might be more more competitive and you need more 80 plus so and it changes every month it changes what states announces what they want more in this month and the depending to that all change Again, remember, expression of interest is not a visa application. You put an expression of interest depending the pool of the applicants who you're competing with in your occupation, you will be picked or not. But because we do many every month, we know, okay, for your occupation, 65 should be sufficient. If it's not, we say, go do another English exam. Maybe you bring a higher points for English. And that's a basic um, first step. So if you have 65, we go to the next step. So you make sure you definitely have to do a skill assessment before you do expression of interest.
I've seen this to many clients who came through to do initial consultation. They get excited, they jump ahead, put their expression of interest. They say, I'll do my skill assessment quickly after. And they get invited without having the skill assessment. So the skill assessment needs to be done beforehand. You have to make sure the points you claim through expression of interest are correct point. Five points lower or higher, the state doesn't like it. They withdraw the invitation. Skill assessments. So if you've done your qualification and work experience overseas, Australia wants to know if your bachelor degree in a different university in Colombia would be equivalent to Australian framework of qualification. Is that equivalent to a bachelor degree? Is that equivalent to an associate degree? Or is it equivalent to a diploma? You'd be surprised. There are many um, universities that would be equivalent the same as Australian qualification. So that that's the qualification part and also your experience part. So they want to know if you work full time as a, a chemist. So you need to provide produce documents, contract, statement of service. This is depending to skill assessment authority would be different. Some skill assessment authority want very detail of everything that you have done to prove that you work. Some actually wants if it's a technician level, some actually wants you go in a center and perform those tasks to make sure that you're actually a chef or your electrician as you say you are and then they assess your experience and they produce you with a with an outcome that say yes you are a chemist and they some bodies they actually give you points as well so and you have five points for your experience overseas which is very helpful and not always is used for migration purposes some of my clients actually use it for applying for jobs in Australia so for a student visa, the process is obviously the first stage is choose a course, an institution. That's the first thing. So do your research. If you're doing this for the purpose of migration, it would be a good idea to get a consult and just say, okay, I'm doing this purely for migration basis. What do I study? So I see, again, misleading information that most people come and do a diploma of leadership and management. That is a useless course. Please don't do it for purpose of migration. But if you want it for your career yes maybe a good course so the first step is choose what you like and what be good for migration choose a course choose a university well confirmation of enrollment would be the next step you get the confirmation of enrollment from that college or university after you receive your confirmation of enrollment the next step would be trying to gather documents to make an application for visa generally speaking the main documents would be the visa application form the passport valid passport confirmation of enrollment there is one thing depending to which country you are from genuine temporary entrance statement gt statement we call it it could be very tricky for some country and we generally do it when there is a, a very difficult gt we all do it if it's a straightforward you know low list countries we get clients do it themselves or do it through education agents it would be a lot cheaper for them that pathway so english language requirement look at what that university requires for your english if you're doing read master by research maybe you need to do academic and again if your English is not good most universities especially at the lower level like undergraduate or master by coursework they offer a semester of English learning so you can do that the first semester or first few months to study English and then start your course so financial documents generally speaking you need to demonstrate you have sufficient funds in your account to cover the tuition fee at least for a few semester maybe at least two living expenses you have return travel expenses but again have in mind it's not for all the countries not everyone needs to provide this we share a link that you can check it's again publicly available you can put your country and the institution you got a, a confirmation of enrollment from and they tell you whether or not you need to provide it not everyone needs to provide it country of middle east everyone almost everyone needs to provide this other thing you need to remember that insurance overseas the student health cover you apply for this after you got your confirmation of enrollment because in case the case of semi requested 
There are very depend what level you're looking at. You have to pick your education agent very carefully. There are registered education agent that university or college is registered by them, like they actually send you to those agents. Most universities, good universities, Sydney University, Melbourne University, Western Australia University, most of them has registered education agent. Use those. If you're applying for master by research or PhD or master even by coursework, work and you're from a lower risk level country, you can do it yourself. Yeah, Have a look at the department website, see what is required. The main things are what we went through, your confirmation of enrollment, your English level, whether or not you have financial document to show. Obviously, even if it's not required, it would be good evidence to show that you have those funds. Or if you don't, I have many clients that they don't, but they can show they have access to it. For example, an auntie or or uncle is showing, yes, I have an account with $40,000 in it and we will support him if he needs it. So that evidence we provided. You probably can go through it, but don't rely on information you find on Facebook. And if you're unsure, reach out to someone. Education agents, good thing about them are they should be free because they get the uh, fees through universities and colleges. Issue with them, especially if you're going through smaller colleges, they may lead you to study courses that only specifically that college offers because that's who they're working with. So if you know I have this course and I have this institution I want to I want to go through and if you're sure with it then go through that education agent. If you're unsure about the course you're studying or the pathway you're going don't consult an education agent. Don't get the advice what should I study because they definitely is biased advice definitely because the payment come through the specific colleges or universities. And how it works is that every semester you study and you pay the university, they get 30% of that. So it's very intensive for them to send you through that college or university. But if you show, I want to go through this college and I want to do this course, definitely use education agent. They make your life a lot easier. Since we don't work with um, mass of a student visa processing, we only have complex student visa or someone refuse and they come to us. So depends to the colleges. I know smaller colleges offer so many different options, but big universities like Sydney University, Melbourne University, if you arrived after first semester, something compassionate and compelling happened to your family or yourself, and then financially you couldn't afford it, I'm sure there's applications you can make. And as long as you hear there are applications of financial assistance or if you are a special category of a person maybe you can apply for a sponsorship or a scholarship but generally for big universities no you you there's a date census date you have to pay your tuition fee by that date for a scholarship, there are some arrangements or collaboration between different universities in the world and between different countries with Australia. If you're from those countries, yes, you have a look at the university or colleges website. I haven't heard anything for a scholarship for colleges, but big universities might be. Just have a look at the scholarship section. There's a different section, national students and international students. Obviously, look at international students would be something you may be able to apply. And it's true application basis obviously you apply whether or not you get it if you're really high level student you may get something and I had a few of our recent clients had this Bachelor of Business degree that it went through the origin scholarship was in the UK but then they went through different country and they concluded in Australia which was very interesting pathway and it was all paid for through different university pull it together as a scholarship and the only assessment was their high level outcome, high performance, and uh, previous qualifications. Having said that, for master by research and PhD by research, there are more scholarship available for international students. So you find what research you want to do, reach out to, uh, if you know someone or, or you have to do your own research, here is we might come helpful through our consultation. We may look if you're a scientist or if you're an engineer or if you have um, biomedical uh, science. So we look at, okay, 
okay, you better look at this university and you better look at this professor's profile, reach out to them, email them. If the um, professors or the lecturer is interested in you, they'll assist you through the scholarship process as well. So they'll, there is a step-by-step forms that they would write and sign on your behalf and support you in getting the scholarship. It's not guaranteed, but it's more likely because each of these professors, they have their own research grants, especially this is particularly relevant to PhD students and postdoc students, postdoctoral students, that those grants, if your research is specifically related to their projects, they can use the grant money to pay you, not only scholarship through uh, universities. So there is an age limit. Again, there, this is we speaking generally because there are so many exemptions for this as well. So the general age limit is 45 for general uh, skilled migration, either through 189 or 190. Having said that, when we talked about point test system, the best age bracket would be from, let me actually quickly check, for age. So if you're over 40, you lose so much point that you feel, okay, maybe Maybe 45 is not the actual age limit, maybe 40 is because, um, yeah, best age bracket is 25 to 33. You get the highest point. After that, you lose some point. And you'll be surprised, 18 to 25 is actually lower points than 25 to 33. But that's the exact age bracket of people who already studied and want to migrate, so they get the highest point. So really, it becomes very difficult after 40. So if you're really looking at it, but doesn't mean a limit. Somebody with 41 maybe has eight years of experience which adds to their points but 45 is a limit for most occupations i give you an example of exemption it would be a university lecture would be exempt for um, the age and different visas on a 482 visa which is employer sponsorship visa if you secure a job and your employer wants to sponsor you on a 482 visa which could be for two or four years depending if they are medium term or short term there's no age limit you can be as i have many I have heard of many clients so I had two recently that they've been staying in Australia almost forever this one client was 70 still working on a 482 so there's no age limit but when you transition you want to transition to permanent residency which is great news recently only after two years used to be after three years specifically on medium occupation after two years and transitioning to 186 then there's an age limit of 45 so you have to be before 45 be able to go through through uh, 186 which is permanent stage again or would be age exemption if you really your your position is high level position senior accountant and you get paid more than high income threshold which is at the moment 162k there is no age requirement so you go through it that's general skill migration pathway which is very interesting but 49 for example the regional one of the regional visa we just talked about 491 at the time of grant of 491 you have to be 45 or lower and if you are there for 191 they don't consider that anymore and global talent visa for example there's not a specific age limit but they say after 55 you need to show substantial benefit to australian economy australian national as general my recent client was an endocrinologist 62 year old is one of my achievements because even colleagues were very surprised that we went through this and we got it granted to her because technically 60 onwards they think is retirement age how could you bring benefit to australia or australia economy anything is possible so there are some business visas that age limit is 55 rather than 45 with a skilled migration but get an advice if you're towards like mid mid 40 get an advice Global Talent Program, it's a very interesting program. This financial year, our new government has reduced the quota from 15,000, just over 50,000 to half to just over 8,000, which is unfortunate, but it's still active. So it's for highly talented individuals that they can prove that they're highly talented in their field of work. Let's say a high-tech engineer. So they most commonly are type of client 
clients, they usually work in a few different countries across the world that so they can show that how their skills are recognized in this field because I work in these different countries or depends what category you go under. You could be academic. As a high tech engineer, I, I go through one of our cases for you. A highly talented engineer from Belgium reached out to us. Origin from Middle East was working in Belgium and was hoping to come to Australia. During consultation, we find out that he had two ideas that patented and that was very key in his process of application. So there is no strict requirement per se, like a skill migration, you have to have 65 points, you have to do skill assessment, English, this and that. It's quite broad and that's one program you definitely get a very good help migration lawyer, migration agents to go through this process. This is one thing I don't advise you to do it by yourself, you waste your time. There's no skill assessment required, which is attractive for some people because some people don't not, they, what they have done in their career would not categorize under one occupation. And we have quite a few in that scenario. Minimum, very, very low level English is required. And especially if you are very talented, but you live in a country you never used English, you didn't need English, it's very low. And generally speaking, to know whether or not you should consider this, you would know if you have a, a niche skill or expertise in a field. You could be even a gamer, you know, work in gaming industries or finance industries or being a researcher at university or being an artist, a performer. A performer actually is a good one because if you perform across the world and people know you, that's a very easy making an application for that person. If you have just a business owner and you just run businesses in your home country and it's not a specific business or innovative business or anything special, maybe you just had a retail shop and you just ran them. So it's more of looking at business visa for you, 188 streams, which a stream is good for you depending to turnover and profit and all that. So we advise you on that. But if it's a specific research or entrepreneurship or innovative ideas, then you could be looking at global talent pathway. So we did have clients that that's all they did. So they had so many new ideas came out through this research company and it was absolutely difficult to put them under any occupation to do a skill migration. So we did a global talent program for them. Especially one of our recent consultation was a researcher from Chile and he was a researcher. He was an university lecturer. The occupation of university lecture available on occupation list but there is not an occupation as a researcher. Trying to fix that, this new government by the end of this year, the new program will, will fix that gap. But he was falling through gaps because there was not a specific group category for him. We assessed him for global talent because of his attendance to many conferences in Europe here and here and number of conferences and research publication. And that's what we assess. We look at impact factors and how many impact factors that person and his research has and how many other research was sort of um, relying on his research that's very important so we put him through uh, global talent who studied here the pathway is quite uh, clear if they have any background qualification get an advice you might go through this a lot faster than you anticipate by studying or finishing your degree if you just studied a bachelor degree or master's degree obviously the obvious answer after this would be uh, going through a 485 visa post uh, graduate visa and um, depending to the what category you study could be two years four years and even six years uh, if it's PhD so on that visa you have full-time work rights and full-time study rights so you try to find employment as soon as possible preferably in your uh, related occupation or uh, study you did and most possibly in that field after one year you can get a skill assessment and as quickly you can put an expression of interest depending if you meet the minimum points that's a very simple pathway people go through and there are many people going through that they study a two years master degree here and then after that uh, on a 485 they find a good job and then one year after that skill assessment and go through PR
But you'd be surprised how many of you, your audience, may already have a pathway to PR and they study here and the finance is tight and not specifically they want to continue study. So especially if you're on master's degree, most of our clients get out of voice, go through the uh, process sooner than they finish their master's degree. And one specific example, a, a medical student, happy ending, but sad story because she had to stop studying and take leave because she couldn't pay the tuition fee. As a medical student, the tuition fee is quite expensive per subject. So she took a leave and then somebody referred her to us after she took a leave. We looked at her, what have you been, how have you been supporting yourself while you've been here? She was from, she's Mauritius. She was from Mauritius background, but lived in France. So I, I studied French. I teach French um, as a private tutor to my professor, to uh, this and that. And I said, well, that that's a good occupation. How many hours per week? And she said this many hours per week. And we ended up choosing an occupation on the list for her as a private tutor. And she went through a skill assessment. And eventually we are doing expression of interest and visa for her. So when she wants to study, definitely wants to study. So when she becomes PR, there are more help for tuition fees and there are more support. And she may be able to apply for it. So many other scholarships that she doesn't have access definitely want to go back to study but some other client another client we did was doing master of public health and he is a doctor back home so we said okay let's register you as a medical practitioner and successfully he did and he was working as a social worker he wasn't interested in public health at all you do public health if you're interested in research then you're actually working in social work area or as a medical practitioner so he decided to stop studying after he went through this so you may or may not need to study and even if you're studying and you have degree and experience back home it may help you to get ahead of that simple step-by-step -step process you may become a permanent residency resident and sooner and get help for your tuition fee. A medical practitioner and overseas registered nurses may be one of the most complex ones across all the occupations because they need to medical practitioners specifically to become fully registered and do independent migration. They need to pass the full registration from APRA. The APRA requires them to do an examination, which some clients reported back to me that it's quite difficult uh, to pass. But there are different level of registration provisional registration if you pass that which is a, most people can manage passing that you may be able to work here on a 482 visa employer sponsorship a clinic or hospital sponsor you while you're here to eventually move on to the permanent residency yes so that's that's one of but it's available to do it even if you're overseas but a, a most complex uh, occupation i guess to go through but depending to if you are a doctor but you may i came across a general general practitioner but work in different field as well so if you worked as a in a community and did social work as well you may be looking at different occupation not a specifically medical practitioner a hundred percent yes yes that's our majority of our clients people who are already here they want their family members they get um, consultation for brother sister or cousins or parents again depends what they want if they want just uh, for the family to come visit and if uh, depending to the which country they're from we organize visitor pathways for them if they actually want to their permanent residence they want to sponsor parents to come here very interesting recent case this client of ours got permanent residence see a lot earlier than they expected and they said oh what about my parents can I bring my parents now and you definitely can sponsor your parents there are category of parent visa contributory parent visa and normal parent visa unfortunately normal parent visa takes ages 30 years plus that's technically it's been redundant so nobody uses this unless the parents are already here or they are quite old I had client that decided to go through that pathway because the parent was 85 plus 
class and they decided just go on that long path and the parent can stay here on a bridging visa depending what their age is on a bridging visa for the rest of their life but again general advice their parent visa depending how old is your parent it could be 4A2 option we've done across all the boards we've done a 4A2 for a parent who is still working and then they're here so they can earn the money and then eventually do their own path or the parent visa again and we have done recently we have signed in with a, a very talented parents so they went through global talent we haven't we just initiated we haven't started the process yet but they decided in a set of contributing parent visa which is surprisingly from this financial year takes 12 years it used to only take six years now whoever lodges now and onward would take 12 years and the second visa charges is very dear it's like about overall process forty five thousand dollar per parent so if you have two parents going through this you have to think about 100k i need for this process but i have clients and actually surprisingly not rich hard-working cafe restaurant manager working with a 60k income maximum that's saving up because it takes 12 years it's possible to save up and you don't have to pay it until the day departments say we're ready to grab to your parents this visa here is the the money you need to pay us pay it now and then after you pay that money you get a grant for your parents oh wow that's amazing so you pay once basically they're ready to pay ready. Pay so you. you have technically 12 years and i would say this whoever is thinking about contributing parent visa get an advice and lodge it as soon as possible every year there's a certain number of parent visa contributing parent visa can be granted meaning the later you lodge it, it that doesn't mean you go only one year back it could be double triple sudden because we went from six years waiting time to 12 years waiting time just over one year and i would say it's because of post-covid recovery everyone felt it through covid that they couldn't see their parents and even if they were doubting it and it was too expensive for them before covid they said life is more important family is more important let's just lodge it and there's so many people lodged it all at once and that became 12 years because that certain number every year doesn't change so that stays the same and depending to the Man, they either increase the fees or change this program altogether. And if you lodge this, that's why I tell my clients who are considering this, that as soon as you lodge it, any changes doesn't affect your parents. Increasing fees or any requirement changes, it doesn't affect your parents anymore. Yes, actually, there is a category under 491 regional area that you can sponsor your siblings, immediate family members. You have to be in that specific area, living and working, set, being settled there, and you sponsor your sibling whose occupation is on that list and is a skill assess for that area. Yes, it's possible, but not as a just similar. It it's not, doesn't have an equivalent of parent visa, like a sibling visa, just because it's a sibling of a permanent residency they can be sponsored no they have to be skilled as well Uh, this is really really good question so many people ask these questions and recently i had a client had to go back home because nobody could get those documents for them to send it yes i was very surprised and they couldn't get it for them to post it they had to actually travel back so so many documents i may miss something here uh today but um we have a settlement checklist guideline on our website that talk, walks you through what exactly step by step of the migration process not only that but part of it is the document you need to bring so talking about documents obviously passport documents birth certificate and if it's cheaper in your home country get it all certified properly back home and bring it with you and qualification documents so your bachelor degree your transcripts your diploma your transcripts of diploma if you have evidence of an asset you have back home bring it with you because you may come and a student visa and see me and do it do a consultation and and say oh i'm a pathway for pr so and i said okay show me some asset or something about your business i don't have it if you're running a business information about your business um 
What about health documents? Yes, definitely. Your medical documents, bring them with you. If you need a script from your GP, bring that with you. Uh, do a little bit of research if your medication is available in Australia. If not, get a permission, contact custom, whether or not you can bring medication with you. There is certain limit for a specific medication to bring in the home country. And it can be very expensive if you're on a specific medication in Australia if you don't have permanent residency. Business, um, you don't have to have a permanent residency to open a business here. Anyone can register an ABN, which is free. Well, running a business is not free, but registering a name for your business is free. The first step is think about what you want to, what the business you want to do. Obviously, check the limitation of your visa. If you're on a student visa, your work limits goes to 48 hours per fortnight. It used to be historically only 40 hours per fortnight, but now it's 48 eight hours but if you're working in a health industry that can be full-time still so it depends what you're doing what visa you're holding for example if you're holding 485 visa which is unlimited work then it doesn't limit you yes you can register a business but you could be on a partner visa or waiting for a partner visa that again you can do any work you want and register your business think about idea of the business the structure of business depending which state you are in there so much free help through that state like uh, information wise that what I need to do obviously choose an accountant step by step go through that very much depend what's the structure of business if it's service basis or online base if it's a retail base then there's a different policy they need to follow and they have to have a license for that program for our business we need to have a migration or agent or a lawyer to be using the practicing certificate or a license to be able to register this business and every year there are professional developments you need to pursue in whatever uh, category you are for us we need to attend seminars do courses to keep ourselves updated with the most recent updates of migration law there are few mistakes I've seen in my career, but there are, for example, specifically mistakes happen on very easy application processes. If you're from risky countries, visitor visa, most people think I can apply for visitor visa. I'm just going to go see my sister or my brother or my parents. It's easy. And that genuine temporary intent on that visitor visa is quite difficult to achieve, especially if you're from different um, region. I've seen so many people getting it refused and then coming to us, which makes the second application a bit more challenging and other common mistake I've seen that people not realizing some of the requirements are time of application requirements not time of decision we have time of application requirements time of decision make sure is the department website doesn't spell that out it just says you need this 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 but it doesn't say if you need the English outcome IELTS or PT or TOEFL whichever it is at the time of lodgement so many people on 485 visa applicants they don't realize that okay i'll do that i'll, I'll organize my um, exam next week and i already lodged the 485 visa and they certainly and they got it and i had a client couldn't accept this went to aat for it appealed the decision and they said we don't have power to hear this because it's a time of application requirement we can't take the time back to that time before you apply so this is very very important important unfortunately it's not available on for public legislation when you go through legislation there's a schedule one requirement and schedule two requirement schedule one requirement are validity requirement meaning if your application is not large meeting those requirements your application is not even valid let alone with it, whether or not they assess it through eligibility requirement or not such as partner visa if you haven't been living together for 12 months and haven't waived that criteria by registering a de facto relationship then it's not valid the application is not valid even if you've been together for 10 years the application is not valid but there are waivers for most things and that's why you take advice you go and take advice okay we haven't lived together but we want to lodge it before first we had this before first of july because there is a six percent increase in department fees can we do it and i was like well yes have you lodged a de facto relationship or can you lodge a de facto relationship in one case we could have we had enough time to do that 
that and they were happy to do it and make sure it's not it's general advice please don't go ahead and lodge a de facto relationship talk to a family lawyer because there are implication on when you lodge a de facto relationship in australia it's very much the same as marriage so there is implication of that for each party but it's again easy to cancel that de facto relationship if it doesn't work out there is a cooling period and then you can cancel it but that's just an example of what is the common mistake but people don't realize some of the requirements are time of application requirements and you can't even going to court doesn't work it court doesn't hear your case at the moment, current immigration law, because this is, we anticipate it might change. If you live in Australia four years on any any visa, but one year as a permanent resident, then you are eligible for citizenship. But there is a resident requirement for that application. So they're looking at how much you traveled outside Australia. So there is a 12 months in the past four years, and there is a 90 days in past 12 months. So if you straight after COVID, you went outside and traveled the world for six months. Unfortunately, you push that eligibility time a little bit back. So in very, very clearly, there is actually should be um, a link that you would check your movement record and it tells you whether or not you're eligible for citizenship. On that citizenship application, very, very important requirement is character requirement. And uh, we're not only talking about criminal records here, even the traffic offenses, even if they are reoccurring there's so many red light passes or you lost the license because uh, there's so many traffic offenses for a while that actually affects your citizenship application. So if you have anything in your record, including traffic offenses, get an advice. We may, someone may be, a professional may advise you, wait six months for this to pass, get your license back before you make an application. It's not that you deserve a citizenship. It's more of about if you are a standing citizen for Australia to give you a citizenship to stay. It's not a per se, what are the eligibility, tick, 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 I'm eligible. No, it's more than that. They look at, okay, are you a standing citizen? Are you of a good character? There is actually an interview and examination involved. And then they give you, a, a it's an honor technically, rather than a visa to hold or a permanent residency. Exactly for whatever we discussed about, because using a very skilled migration agent or immigration lawyer, it's very important. They can save you years of your time. They can offer, especially maybe not if you're unsure or you cannot afford the services, get an advice and not a free advice. Please don't get a free advice. What I tell to my client, free advice is expensive for you. A paid advice is a good advice. Somebody that is happy to write that advice down, sign their name at the end of that advice letter, send it to you for you to have it. Whether or not you want to work with them or not, get that written advice letter. So they might introduce you options that you may not be even aware of it and it happens a lot in our career that somebody i give you a very brief example an it professional here was trying for years very hard to get better and better in points so she he can go through an it specialist and got an advice got a pr through event organization completely something his quote was in a wildest time i wouldn't even imagine if i use my event organizational skills to get a permanent residency so it might be options that save you years it might be option that save you money getting pr earlier and then using government help for paying off your study it might be again we talked about validity requirement that you may not even know especially i see this a lot in 485 visa applicants that they get banned or they miss that six months period of finishing study because they didn't know that was the requirement so if you're very 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 skilled and you've done 10 visas in your lifetime and you're specifically doing a visa that you don't know anything about get your advice make sure nobody none of the migration agents or lawyers go through your application in the consultation but they assess your options and offer you the best pathway to permanent residency good thing to consult with migration agents just to so if you the, the, the option you picked is the right option for you it's a correct option, especially if someone for a skilled migration has experience with the skill assessment. I've seen this and heard this many uh, times that clients say, we just decided to go for this occupation and whether or not the outcome is positive. You don't need to spend almost $2,000 with a skill assessment authority to know
know whether or not okay let's try a lot yeah, the proper advice the agent or lawyer they supposed to advise you this is a good occupation with your experience and you likely get on a positive outcome and then you, you take your steps more certain in this way we are almost everywhere so migration affairs has a very good website actually subscribe to our newsletter because we provide all the information and updates of migration law as it comes quickly one of our uh, lawyers job is get the news write it up post it on the newsletter on linkedin you can find us reach out to us instagram you can find us reach out to us facebook you can find us twitter we're not as active but you can also find us and we are based in sydney cbd also in Adelaide and um, most of our consultation done over Zoom like what we're doing right now because clients are uh, all over the world. If you see our homepage there's a map of where our clients are from and, and we do it most of it over Zoom. If anybody wants to come in more than welcome we arrange a time for them to come in but have a look at our website. There's a section that you can briefly write your inquiries and if you give us enough we actually would advise you or your phone number. We initially pick up the phone call you speak five or ten minutes to make sure you get something out of our consultation if we think you might not we just say okay maybe it's not the right time for you maybe finish if you're studying 18 year old studying bachelor degree maybe it's not right time right now and uh, later on get an advice but having said that 18 year old get an advice can put themselves on the right track 100 thank you so much tarane oh it was good to talk to you martina thank you yeah so good